gathering. It's great to see you all here for another installment of our online worship this week. Whether you're worshiping in the morning or the afternoon, we're glad to see you here and glad that you can join us as we worship, as we praise our God. So let's jump right into our first song, Sweetness of Freedom, and declare who we'll follow for the rest of our lives. So let's sing. <laughs> to proclaim the sweetness of freedom that we found. Let's greet one another this morning and make sure that everyone in our church family in the gathering feels welcome. So let's take this time. to our next song. I just want to read from Hebrews 10. Um, it's just something that we've been trying to think about this past week where, you know, in every other aspect of our lives, 
our worth is is based on merit. It's based on how many times we succeed or fail. If we mess up, then we're worth less. If we succeed, then we're worth more. But it's never enough. And sometimes we fall into a cycle of that kind of thinking. Um, thank goodness, though, our salvation isn't based on pluses or minuses or the good deeds or the bad deeds that we've done, but it's laid out in Hebrews, so Hebrews 10, 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So, it's not by our deeds, it's not by our actions, or even our intentions. It's by how Christ split that veil open for us, bringing us into the fold, bringing us into his family. So, as we sing about that, let's sing about how it's His grace alone.
what you have to say to us. Because a relationship works both ways. This is you speak to us, let us speak to you. As you hear us, let us hear you, Lord. And Lord, thank you for your kindness, for your forgiveness, your goodness. I pray that we draw ever closer to you. It's in your son's precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everyone. Hope that all of you are doing well. And we want to once again thank you for joining us as we worship and as we study the Bible together. What a privilege it is to be able to do this. Even if we're physically separated, we're able to do this because we're united in Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. Nehemiah is a book in the Old Testament, and we're going to spend the next several months examining this book. Now, Nehemiah is a man who God called to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we're going to see how God called Nehemiah and what Nehemiah did to rebuild the walls. And as we study his life, we're going to make some application to our own lives with where we are right now. And this is such an important book for us to examine, especially in our time. You see, as we look around us, we see so much brokenness. We see the effects of COVID-19. We also see the effects that are not related to COVID-19. And then we examine our own personal lives and we see the brokenness in our own lives. And this coming Tuesday, we're going to have the election here in the United States. And, and, and we just see a lot of division in our nation. And then we look at our own personal lives and we see all of this brokenness, right? And so when we, we examine all of this, it leads us to ask a big question. And the question is this, how can I rebuild? Or how do I rebuild? Well, we really believe that the book of Nehemiah will speak directly into your life and into my life as we see how God used Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now today, what we're going to examine is this. We're going to examine Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 9 through 20. And as we do that, we're going to see what a good idea looks like versus a God idea. You see, for many of us, we may have good ideas and we have good intentions and we move forward with those good ideas. But over time, here's what happens. First of all, the good ideas may work. In fact, our good ideas may work out. But as we're moving forward with a good idea, if it's not a God idea, that idea will not give our hearts life. It will not point us to Jesus, and, and we can be as successful with that idea, but we're going to come to a place where there's emptiness, and there's a sense of disconnect, and we wonder what our purpose is. And so sometimes we think, well, I have a good idea, but if a good idea is not a God idea, then it's really not a good idea. Or there are times we think we have a good idea, but it's not a God idea, and we move forward with the good idea. Here's, but here's what often happens. If it's not a God idea, because God's not behind it, because God's not pushing us forward, many times as we take that good idea and we confront our issues in life, or even with rebuilding, right? We can, we can say, I have a good idea. I'm going to take this good idea. I'm going to try to rebuild with this good idea. But as we move forward in the process of rebuilding, if it's not a God idea, that good idea has a great potential, right? It has a great chance of collapsing and breaking down. And maybe some of you have experienced that in your own personal lives as you have lived, as you have made decisions, and maybe as you pursued a good idea in the process of rebuilding. And, and you, you see that once your good idea confronts all of the challenges that rebuilding will throw at you, or maybe rebuilding has thrown at you, you've seen your ideas collapse. And then you're left to wonder, where am I? Who am I? How do I move forward? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to see what a God idea looks like and how a God idea will drive us as we move forward in the process of rebuilding. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this passage. We're going to break it down. And in the end, we're going to try to answer the question, how does all of this apply to my life with where I am today? All right, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9. It says this, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates, 
and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. All right, so here's what's going on. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah, he heard a report of what was going on in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem was in despair. The city was destroyed. The walls were, were, were flattened out, and the gates were burned down. And this caused Nehemiah to be very, very, very sad. He was broken over the condition of Jerusalem. And as a result of the report that Nehemiah heard, Nehemiah sought the Lord. He prayed, he mourned, he cried, and, and he just... He just cried out and he prayed and he sought God with everything that he had. And God revealed to Nehemiah that he would be the one to go to Jerusalem and to lead the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah, last week, this is what we learned. Nehemiah asked King Artaxerxes for a few things. And one, one thing that he asked for was this, was a letter, right? was a letter. King Artaxerxes was a king of Persia. And Nehemiah would have to travel from Susa, that's the capital of the Persian Empire. Nehemiah would be traveling 800 miles westward. Now, as he went westward, there were other nations that were between Susa and, and Jerusalem. And many of these people would not have known who Nehemiah was. But this letter that, that Nehemiah received from King Artaxerxes, this letter protected Nehemiah from any attack by any other nation, right? So when the governors of the, these other provinces and regions, when they saw this, they said, whoa, Nehemiah is protected by the king. And so Nehemiah had safe travel 800 miles from Susa all the way to Jerusalem because he had this letter. This is a letter that he requested from King Artaxerxes. And so it says, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. So King Artaxerxes also gave Nehemiah protection. He gave Nehemiah horses and, and, and other people from his palace and other people from the Persian Empire to go along with Nehemiah. So you can imagine what that journey looked like. Here's Nehemiah. He had a letter. He was also protected by people from the king's army. And then in verse 10 says this, when Sambalot the Horonite, right? So Sambalot the Horonite, most likely Sambalot was a governor of Samaria located north of Jerusalem and Tobiah the Ammonite official. And what it is, it's believed that Tobiah was from Ammon. He came from a powerful family in Ammon. Ammon was located east of Jerusalem. It says, when Sambalot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard that someone had come to pursue the pr prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. Verse 11, after I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. Okay, so imagine this, Nehemiah, he was there, he was there for three days, and one night, right, after three days, he gets up, and, and he gets on his horse, and he, he takes a tour of the city of Jerusalem. And what Nehemiah was doing here it was this, that he heard the report from Hanani, Nehemiah also read scripture of what Jerusalem used to look like. Nehemiah had an idea of what it used to look like. And based on Hanani's report, he had an idea of what it looked like, right? Based on that report, what it looked like today. And so Nehemiah, he had an idea, but, but he wanted to see for himself what Jerusalem looked like. So he got on a horse at night and he began to explore the city. And then... Um, in verse 13, it says this, I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went to the fount gate and the king's pool, but farther down, it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by the way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, 
You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be in disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. Verse 19, listen to this. When Sambalot the Horonite, okay, so Sambalot located, or he's from the north, right, from a, from a region north of Jerusalem, and says Tobiah the Ammonite, lo, uh, Ammon located east of Jerusalem, and now there's a new guy, Geshem the Arab. So where Geshem was from was south of Jerusalem. So you can see there were surrounding regions, right, these were leaders or important people from these surrounding regions, they heard about this, and and this is their reaction, right? It says, um, when they heard about this, they mocked and despised us. When they said they heard about what was going on, they despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Verse 20, I gave them this reply. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. All right, so what I want us to examine, first of all, as we look at this passage, is this. What prevents us, or what stops us from rebuilding? You see, Nehemiah, in this passage, faced some challenges that could have prevented him from rebuilding. So let's look at what those challenges were. Number one, Nehemiah faced resistance, right? He faced resistance. In verse 10, in verse 10, we see that Nehemiah, he encountered Sanballat and Tobiah. And then in verse 19, mentions Sanballat and Tobiah again, but also mentions Geshem, right? Geshem. They came from regions that surrounded Jerusalem, from the north, from the east, and from the south. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they did not want to see the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Here's why. Because as long as Jerusalem was in despair, as long as the, the, the walls were, 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 were in disrepair and, and destroyed, they felt as though they had nothing to worry about. That, that as long as, as Jerusalem was, was broken and its people were, were, their lives were shattered and as long as the people were, were, were poor and as long as the people had no power, that made these surrounding regions and the leaders of these surrounding regions feel very good about themselves. They, they felt very safe, right? They felt very safe. But when they heard that the walls were about to be rebuilt, when they heard that the city of Jerusalem uh, was about to be restored, right? Because when there's a restoration of the walls, it also symbolized the restoration of the city. This caused Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem to feel threatened. Their power was threatened, right? For the longest time, over 100, for over 100 years, Jerusalem laid in ruins. And the people were in despair. But now, the walls are going to be rebuilt. This will be a city that will begin to put its act together, will grow in power. And so if they became powerful their power, the power in Jerusalem, would be a threat to the power of the regions around Jerusalem. This is also a threat to the resources in the area, right? So if, if, if Jerusalem was going to be built up, they would also take in resources, resources that, that um, they may never have had before, resources that, that other regions were able to enjoy because Jerusalem was so weak. And then this was a threat because of influence. If Jerusalem became more powerful, then Jerusalem would have influence in among the people, not only Jerusalem, but among peoples around the city of Jerusalem. So Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, they were very threatened, right? They were very threatened by the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And because they felt threatened, they put up some resistance. Okay, they were threatened and they put up some resistance. Now, we see this in our own personal lives. Right now, some of you, you're wanting to rebuild. Or maybe you have 
try to move forward in the process of rebuilding. But as you move forward in rebuilding, you see that there's resistance, right? You see there's resistance. And we see resistance in many areas of our lives when we try to rebuild. One of the first areas that we may see resistance is this, with people, right? With people. People may resist you uh, rebuilding. If, if they see you making choices, if they see you choosing a direction that, that you want to move towards, if they see you recommitting your life to Jesus and you're growing stronger in Christ, or maybe there's some of you, you're not a believer, but you, you, you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus saves you. Your life is changed. You, you, you become more powerful in, in your confidence, not because you're confident in yourself, but you're, Jesus places that confidence in confidence in you. And, and as a follower of Jesus, as you're, you're moving forward with, with confidence with your future, and it's not because you place your confidence in your future. Jesus is just, you just, you're just confident in Christ. And Jesus is giving you confidence as you move forward. When people begin to see that, they may resist that because your life is now a threat to who they are. Your life is now a threat to their position. Your life is now a threat to their status your life is a threat to their belief system, right? There are just many reasons people will try to resist you. In addition to that, circumstances may resist you, right? Maybe for a period of time, you were compliant to your circumstances. You lived in your circumstance. And maybe there are circumstances around you that may have controlled you. There may have been circumstances that dictated your choices and your future. But now you're saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to trust Jesus for this rebuilding. And as your life is being rebuilt, as, as Jesus rebuilds your life one step at a time, the circumstances that were once a part of you will now challenge you. Why? Because the, the circumstances, right, there, there's this balance, right? There's this balance. And, and oftentimes when, when we may be broken, when we are struggling, there are other circumstances that find the balance in our struggle. But when we begin to rise because of what Jesus is doing in us, the circumstances around us may, may feel threatened, right? Either people feel threatened or circumstances uh, just may not seem right. And so now our circumstances challenge us. And even when we make choices, we're going to see how choices in rebuilding affect us other areas of our lives and those areas may be our circumstances so circumstances may may resist us or how's about this one resources right resources when we say Jesus I'm going to follow you I'm going to choose you I'm going I'm going to follow you in in, in how you desire to rebuild my life we're going to see that resources may resist us what are some of these resources well time Time is a very important resource, and, and, and so as we follow Jesus, we, we're going to see that rebuilding requires time, and we may think that we don't have time because we've got to work, we have relationships, we have responsibilities, and now to rebuild, it's about spending more time with Jesus and honoring the direction that Jesus is calling us to go. Uh, we, we're going to wonder, where's the time going to come from? Or how's about this one? Money, right? Money. For some... Rebuilding as, as God calls you to rebuild as you're following Jesus. There may be some areas of your life that may require some money, right? And uh, whatever that looks like. It, it may be that, that, that you, you release yourself from your job and that's going to cost you money. It may, it, you may find that, that you, you need to invest in something other than what you're investing in right now, whether it's your mental health or physical health or whatever that is, there needs to be some kind of investment. Or maybe as a follower of Jesus, they're, they're giving back to God, right? What God requires has been something that you have withheld. And, and as a result of that, um, you realize that if I'm going to honor God with my life, this is an area that I need to trust God with, with my finances. And, and so now as you're rebuilding, you're saying, well, I, I'm going to need to give God what belongs to God financially, right? So they're just, that may be a resistance that, that you are facing in your life right now, or maybe energy, Maybe energy. Some people choose not to rebuild because rebuilding, even the thought of rebuilding, is just, it's just too tiring. And, and we don't know if we have the energy. And the list can go on and on. But when we choose to rebuild, because we're following Jesus, we face resistance. And so right now, 
You may have chosen to follow Jesus. You're choosing to trust Jesus to, to help you rebuild in the areas of your lives. Or maybe you haven't chosen to follow Jesus yet, but, but you will. Just know that just because you choose to rebuild doesn't mean that everything's just going to be smooth and happy and you're going to have no problems and you won't face resistance. Sometimes the greatest resistance that you will face happens after you surrender to Jesus. But let me tell you this. It is so worth it. It is so worth it to follow Jesus with our lives for salvation. It is also worth it to follow Jesus with our lives and salvation and also for the direction of our lives and the process of rebuilding. And even when you do face resistance, know that Jesus is with you. And, and the way that he carries you through resistance is how he's going to build foundation, how he's going to build into you, how he's going to build your future. All right. So just because you face resistance, number one, it doesn't mean that, that God is against you. Secondly, uh, just because you face resistance, that doesn't mean that, that you need to stop. Oftentimes, when you're in Christ, when you have God's idea, resistance simply means that you're heading in the right direction. All right, number two, second thing that stops us from rebuilding, reality. Reality stops us from rebuilding. Some of you are like, what do you mean by that, James? Well, let me give you an example. You see, when I was a boy, uh, I started watching football, whether it was the Dallas Cowboys or the University of Hawaii football games, right? I, I would just watch football. Uh, my, my dad would watch football, so I would watch football. And, and so some of you wonder, well, James, why are you a Dallas Cowboy football fan? Or how did you become such a strong Hawaii Warrior fan? Well, we grew up that way, right? And so we, we have this affection for for Dallas Cowboy football and University of Hawaii football. Now, I know some of you out there, you're going, James, I don't like you that much anymore because you're a Cowboy fan. Okay, we're united in Christ, not, not by our favorite football team, okay? But, but, it, but and so this just shows how great of a love we all have for each other. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, that when I was a child, from the time I was young, I would watch football and I would see how people would run with the football and how they would get tackled. Now, in my mind, I would often tell my dad as we were watching these games, I would say, Dad, why do these people go down when people are trying to tackle them? You see, because in my childhood mind, I thought all you need to do is run hard. All you need to do is try to run fast. All you need to do is try to power your way through people and over people, and you will never get tackled, right? So in my mind, in my ideal mind, in the image that I had, um, that, that's what I thought it would be like to be running with a football, that if, if I just did that, then I wouldn't be tackled. Well, my parents did not let me play football until I was in the eighth grade. And so in the summer before my eighth grade year, I trained really, really hard, and I still had the image in my mind from the time I was a child, that, that said, as long as I try hard enough, and, and if I run fast enough, and if I power my way through, I will never be tackled. That was the image that I had in my mind. And so, in the summer before my eighth grade year, I ran mile after mile after mile. I ran wind sprints. I ran on the beach. I ran in the water. I thought, in a, here's what I thought. In addition to my mind, which said that I can break all tackles, I thought, well, if I train hard enough, then I'm going to ensure that I will never be tackled, that I could never be put on the ground. That was the image that I had. And I, I can remember just thinking that I'm going to be the best football player in Hawaii and that, that when, I, when, when we play, when I play, that I will never be tackled. That, that's the image that I had. And so I was so excited about trying out for football for the very first time. I was excited about what my football career would look like. In fact, even before my, my eighth grade year, I told my mom that I was going to become a professional football player and that I was going to buy my mom a house and I was going to buy my mom and dad a car, right? And so I was just, I was already planning that. I had this, this image, this, this vision of what I thought it was going to be like. And then we had tryouts for football. And I realized that my image of what I thought I could be or should be did not match up with the reality. In fact, the reality was crushing me. There were some big, strong, powerful, fast dudes who were just hitting me so hard, putting me on the ground that, that, that I, um, I almost felt like quitting, right? It's because the reality of, of what I needed to go through was different from the image. 
I did not quit. Um, I, I made it on the team and eventually, um, you know, I became a starter that year. But, but I started from the bottom and I had to really work my way up to the top. But here's what I'm trying to say. Many of us, when we have this image of rebuilding, we think that, we think that wow, this is what it's going to look like. This is what I imagined for it to be. We come up with ideas and we have hopes and dreams. We go to conferences. We, we hear people encourage us. Uh, and and we, we spend time with God and we're so inspired by, by what's on our heart. And so we think that, 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 that when we move forward with rebuilding, that, that it's going to be good, that, that it's going to be awesome, that there's going to be a smooth path and that we're not going to face any challenges. But what often happens is our image faces reality. And if our image is our idea and not God's idea, Oftentimes, the image that we carry into reality can often be crushed. But even if our, the image that we have is from God, if, even if the idea that we have is from God, taking that into the reality of the situation, it, it's, it's difficult. We're going to face many, many challenges. But it is what God did in our hearts to, to call us, to give us a vision and to convict us of this rebuilding. It's what God does in our hearts at that moment, the strength that he gives us that will carry us through the, the difficult times when, 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 when we face the reality of the situation. Right now, many of you are facing some very, very difficult situations. You're facing difficult circumstances. And as you're praying to God, as you're seeking the Lord, you're sensing that you know, maybe God has this for you, or maybe God is, is giving you that direction, and, and it could really be the Lord. But, but one of the mistakes that many of us make is, that, is this. We, we tell ourselves, if I follow God, then, then everything about me is going to be smooth. God's going to provide the way. I'm going to be happy. And when I face the reality, uh, the, all reality is going to start singing, and, and everything's going to be good. I'm going to be super successful. But oftentimes that is not how it happens. That is why it's important as we move forward in, in what God is calling us to do in rebuilding. We need to be sure that, that, that we have God's idea and not just our own idea. You see, Nehemiah, he had a vision from God. He, he had conviction that came from God. He had a plan that came from God. And he had an image of what, what he thought it should be. And that image was from God. But what we see in verse 12 is this, that he went at night with a few men to observe what God laid on his heart. And then we look at verses 13 through 16. Nehemiah observed the condition of the city. He observed the condition of the gates, of the walls. He also observed the people. He, 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 he saw what they were like. He saw what the leaders were like. He examined their attitudes. He, he talked to them and, and, and just saw if they had any strength within them. And also, he examined what they believed about God. And so... When Nehemiah went at night, right, he went at night based on this conviction that God gave him, based on this vision that God gave him, based on this image that God gave him. But Nehemiah, as he went into the city, everything that God placed on his heart would now face the reality of what was really there in Jerusalem. Here's another challenge. Here's another challenge that stop, often stops us from rebuilding. Apathy. All right? Apathy. It's just being satisfied with the way things are. And apathy may be your own apathy, or apathy may be the apathy of the people around us, right? It, it, we can be apathetic to the way things are. We can be satisfied, say, hey, you know what? This is good enough. I'm just going to hang out. Or because the people around us are apathetic to the situation, we become like the people around us. And oftentimes we become apathetic because we become used to a bad situation, right? If you get used to a bad situation over time, that bad situation may not bother you anymore. Or sometimes we become apathetic to a situation because the situation is all that we know. You see, for the people in Jerusalem... The destruction of the city took place over a hundred years earlier. And so everyone who lived in the city, that's all they knew. 
They knew what God expected. They understood their history and how God chose them and how they were supposed to be a blessing to the world and how Jerusalem was God's city. And they, they, they heard about that. They, they knew that. But they were apathetic to the condition that they were in because they did not know any better. They became comfortable in their situation. And oftentimes we become apathetic because we are comfortable, right? We're comfortable. And all of this comfort becomes part of the culture that we're in. We, we live in it. We breathe it. We talk to other people who are just as apathetic as we are. That is what was happening in Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, let me read this. So I said to them, this is Nehemiah. So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Okay, so Nehemiah comes into the city and he makes the people in the city aware of what was happening, right? So he says, so you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's build Jerusalem's walls so that we will no longer be a disgrace. So Nehemiah made the people in the city aware of their condition. And Nehemiah, right, what he said, he said what some people were probably thinking, but they didn't know how to lead the people away from their condition. Or there may have been others. They went on day by day. They're so apathetic. They were unaware that Jerusalem was that broken down. But it's like that in our own personal lives. We have life issues. Maybe you may be a student right now, and you're just going through the motions as a student. You've chosen a major, and this is a major that you're not passionate about. You haven't sought God about what to major in. Instead, you've chosen a major because it sounds cool, or you can, you can make more money if you get a job based on that major, but you know that God may have something different for you. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Stop being apathetic and start seeking the Lord. Or... Maybe right now, some of you are single, right? In your, and in, in your singleness, in your singleness, you become very apathetic. You, you keep telling yourself that, hey, I'm going to honor God once I'm married. Well, let me just share this with you. If, if you have a hard time honoring God in, in your singleness, you're going to have a hard time honoring God in your marriage. Also, if you're a follower of Jesus, right? So, sometimes we, uh, in our singleness, even as Christians, we tell ourselves, well, I'm just going to have fun as, as a single person and, you know, maybe I can kind of uh, just be not as committed to God in my singleness, but when I get married and we have a family, um, you know, when I meet that Christian guy or when I meet that Christian girl, uh, we're going we're gonna to get married and it's, it's going to be happily ever after. Let me just share this with you. I'll be honest with you. If you're thinking that your spiritual apathy as a, as a single person will lead you to find some other person, right, some person who you hope to marry, who's a strong, who's a strong Christian, if you're not walking with Jesus, chances are you're not going to find that person who, who is very passionate about his or her walk with Jesus. You, you need to get off the apathy train and start committing your whole life to Christ, your, your future, your job, your walk with God, your, your daily time with God. All right, give God your all in your singleness. Or, or how's about this one in marriage? Here's what often happens in marriage. Sometimes we, we go on with our lives and we become so used to our spouse that we become apathetic in the ways that we treat our spouse. If you're a follower of Jesus, sometimes we become very apathetic in, in the way that, that we, we seek God in our marriage. And because of that, our, our marriage may be spiritually dead and we don't even know it, right? I mean, we, you, you go through the motions, you go to church, you, um, you, you, you look like a good Christian family, but you know that spiritually you've been so apathetic in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and you're looking around you, and you're saying, well, we're not as bad as them, or we're kind of like them. Well, the reality is, what about you and God? What do you know about your marriage that should be better, that could be better if Jesus was truly at the center of your marriage? Or what about senior adults? What about senior adult? You know, it, I'm not there yet, but, but I can only assume that this happens, that, that maybe in your, in your life you have been active in, in, your, in your relationship with God, you've been active in church, you've been active in ministry, um, you've been giving your all, but during this time of your life you're thinking, well, I can just kind of maybe back off and let the young people do it and it's their turn, but let me, let me just share this with you. We need you. 
We need your wisdom. We need your prayers. We need your encouragement. Your time is not over yet. And we need you. And now, here's, if you're a senior adult, I want to ask you, will, will you do this? Will, will, you, will you just really seek the Lord and say, God, please show me how I can step away from uh, just being satisfied with the way things are and show me how much more you want to use me um, as a senior adult? Or how's about this one? Many of us become very apathetic in our sin. We become very, very apathetic in our sin. Right? It, it's kind of like, hey, um, there, there's sin, but no one else sees my sin, or there's sin in my life, and, and uh, someone else is committing greater sins, or this person, you know, they're, they're struggling with the same sin. And so we look around us, and there, there's, there's spiritual apathy because we're so apathetic towards sin. And it is that apathy that, that is dragging us down spiritually. And if we're looking to rebuild as we focus on Jesus, it makes it hard. If we're, if, if we're apathetic in, in our lives when it comes to sin, it's going to make us make it very hard to hear from God, to, to receive direction from God, to experience the life that God has to offer as we're walking with Jesus. That may be you today. That may be you right now. You know, the gathering began about 13 and a half years ago. Many people wonder, well, how did the gathering happen? How did the gathering begin? Well, the gathering really is God's idea. And I know that I know that the gathering, our church, is truly God's idea. Now, a lot of the, the beginnings of the gathering happened when, I, I believe, when I served at my last church, God was beginning to stir within me. Just this idea, this passion, and this desire to, to start a new church that actually looks and operates a lot like the gathering. During that time, I began to write notes. I began to write down um, what I would do if I led a church like that. And, and I was thinking that we're going to apply this to the last church that I pastored. I really wanted to stay at the last church that I pastored. But there came a time where God made it absolutely clear that I was supposed to step away from that church and to begin the gathering, to start the gathering out of, from, from scratch. Now, when we started the gathering... This was definitely a call from God. Julie and I, as we were on our way to, on a mission trip to Turkey, um, we just really sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to us at that moment that, that we, we needed to start this new church. And while we were away for two, two and a half weeks on this mission trip, uh, God just used people, God used scripture, God used even uh, the teaching that we're going through uh, on this mission trip, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, God used that to speak to our hearts about starting this new church, that we cannot compromise the call that God has placed in our hearts. And so over that period of time, God just really laid on our hearts that, that, that the things that I was wrestling with for the last several years, God was bringing that to the forefront and that I needed to be obedient to what he was calling me to do. And so we came back to Hawaii, just really had this sense of affirmation that God was leading us to start the gathering. And while we were in the planning stages, while we were looking into all the details, and while we were looking forward to what God had in store for us, it was really, really exciting. It was, it was exciting because we had an image of what we thought it was going to be, what we hoped it was going to be. We had this image of, of everything just exploding and, and, and everything just being joyous and, and we're going to be the church with the least amount of problems and, and that God was going to grow our church in such a way that we're going to impact the nations with the gospel in, in a very, very powerful way, right? And so we were so excited, and as we talked, to, talked with our, our leaders, our core group, it was, it was a very, very exciting time. But then we had to take this idea which came from God, this idea from God which gave us a vision, which gave us a calling, which gave us conviction, which also gave us a plan. And we took this idea which came from God, and this idea from God began to confront the reality of where we were. Began to confront the rea reality of, of where we were. And as we began, this idea from God began to confront the reality of where we were, it was very hard. It was very difficult. But you know what kept us going through the years? 
13 and a half years. And, and, and God has done some amazing things in and through the gathering over the last 13 and a half years. God has, has allowed us to, to, to see and to be a part of um, some things that just really blow our minds. But it didn't come without its challenges. And I know that I know that if this idea was not from God, I would have quit a long time ago. If, if the conviction that, that, that we have right now was not from God, the conviction and the calling uh, for the gathering, if it was not from God, we would have given up. Julie and I would have quit a long time ago. You see, to me, one of the greatest miracles of, of any church is the, is, the fact that it, is the fact that it exists. It is the fact that, that people are, are willing and able to stake their lives on the trust that, that God called that church into existence. And so we do not take the opportunity and the privilege of leading the gathering for granted. But we also know, we also know that the gathering is, is God's idea. And we want to be faithful to God's idea. And as long as God has us uh, working with Him and, and trying to fulfill His idea, we're, gonna, we're there. We're there, all right? So you may be wondering, well, well how, James, why are you sharing that? Well, I'm sharing this because when it comes to rebuilding, we need to be certain that God is the one driving our idea. If God is not the one driving our idea, like I said earlier, we may move in a direction where we think life is good and everything's going well, but moving towards that idea that's not God's idea is going to move us further away from God. And then we face emptiness and, and a disconnect in our heart when it comes to God. Or when we actually do face our circumstances and dealing with the reality of, of, of rebuilding, if it's not a God idea, if we didn't have a God idea, the circumstances will crush us. What keeps us going, whether it's fulfilling a vision that God has for us or rebuilding our lives as we move forward, even through this pandemic, it has to be a God idea. So... Let me, let me just share. Let me just share a few things, right? What? Because I know right now you're out there, you're wondering, okay, James, so what's a God idea and what's not a God idea? Well, let me start by sharing with you what is not a God idea. Okay, let me share what is not a God idea. Six things. Number one, um, this is, it's not a God idea when you are the center. Okay, so if you're, if you're rebuilding and you are at the center of rebuilding, most likely that is not a God idea. Also, it is not a God idea when you pray for what you want more than what God wants. Okay, so if you find yourself praying, you're saying, God, make this happen. God, um, please make it turn out this way. And you're not praying for God, show me your will and help me to follow your will, help me to follow your plan, no matter what. Chances are that may not be God's idea. Or how's about this one? Um, it may not be, be a God idea if you or when you pursue an image before seeking God. Okay, so maybe you have an image of what you want the future to look like, right? And so as we go on through rebuilding, you may want the future to look a certain way. And, and you're pursuing that image and you're not really seeking God. And we know that we're not seeking God when, number one, we don't seek God. But secondly, when we have a picture of an image that we want and we say, God, bless the image, Chances are, that's not God's idea, that's your idea. Or how about this one? It may not be a God idea when you seek people's advice more than you seek God. Okay, so maybe you have an idea. Maybe it's a great idea. Maybe it's a good idea. But you're not seeking the Lord. Instead, you're seeking other people's advice more than you are seeking God. Or how's about this one? It may not be a good idea when or if you fail to see who you truly are before God. Okay, what, what I mean by that? Well, oftentimes God places us in a situation of struggle, of trial, of brokenness, of loss, of even confusion, so that we can be at a place where we are seeking Him, that we're seeking Him with all of our hearts. But when we come to that place, the way that we seek God is we begin to look at our own depravity. We begin to look at our own sin. We begin to look at our own brokenness. And we see who we are. We see our sin. We, we, see, we, we see that our sin separates us from God. We, we see our sin. And, and then we see ourselves before a holy God. Now, if your idea in moving forward does not cause you to see who you are before a holy God, chances are 
Your idea may be nothing more than a good idea, but it's not a God idea. How's about this one? It is not a God idea if or when you do not engage with what God is trying to show you. Okay, if you're not engaging with what God is trying to show you, it's probably not a God idea. Right? Maybe, maybe as you're broken and you're praying and you're seek, seeking the Lord, and you may, have an, you may have an idea of where you want to go, but God's saying, no, this is what I want to show you. And you may make compromises with God. You may even do some of what God is saying, but you're not all in with that. And, and you're kind of doing what God wants, but then you're doing what you want. And, and you're just trying to mesh the two together. And it's just not working. Or you may completely say, God, I don't like your idea. And I'm just going to go with what I, what I want, with my idea. Let me tell you this. Chances are that is not God's idea. That is your idea. So... How do we know that we're moving forward with God's idea? Well, let me share with you um, some things that, that if this is our reality in the midst of our struggle, chances are, chances are, we're pursuing God's idea. All right, so let me share with you six things. Number one, we're mostly pursuing God's idea when we earnestly seek God's will, no matter what it will cost us. Okay, so if you earnestly seek God's will, no matter what it will cost you, Chances are you are pursuing God's idea, right? If, if you're saying, God, I, I love you. God, I, I, I want to honor you. And, and you understand the cost of following God's idea. And you're willing to, to just surrender everything to, to follow God's idea. No matter what it'll cost you, chances are you are pursuing God's idea. You are also most likely... And to pursue God's idea when you hear from God through his word, through prayer, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so if it, it's more than just having a feeling. People, you know, when, when we ask people, how do you know this is God? Well, people say, well, you know, it was a feeling that I had. Uh, uh, it, it just seemed to work out. It has to be more than that. You need to be someone who seeks God through his word. You need to be someone who seeks God through prayer. You need to be someone who definitely hears from the Holy Spirit. And some of you may be wonder, wondering, how does that work? Well, you just need to be in the Word. You need to be in prayer. And you need to be communicating with God through His Spirit. And the more we engage with God and seek Him that way, the more sensitive we become to the things that matter to God. Number three, we are most likely um, to pursue a God idea when or if we receive wise, godly counsel. All right? Um... If we try to pursue an idea and think that this is a great idea, and we may even think that it's from God, maybe we're at church, and, and, and maybe right now, as, as you're hearing this message, there's some ideas of rebuilding in your mind, and, and you may have some, some ideas, and you're taking notes, and in fact, you're writing down what you want your future to be like. Let me tell you this, unless it's based on the Word of God, unless it's based on on what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, unless you have prayed about it, and then sought wise, godly counsel. Let me tell you this. Chances are, I'm not saying that it's not, but chances are it may not be a God idea. What, what makes it, what puts you in a greater position for this to be a God idea is, that, is if you're really, truly seeking wise, godly counsel. Now, I know in my life, when there were times I wanted something to happen and I thought it was a good idea, I, I knew that, that there were people, and I still have people in my life who I go to, I share ideas with, and, and these are wise men and women who give me good, solid, godly counsel. They love God, they love Jesus, they're in the Word, they're people of prayer, and their whole lives exude the things of God. I go to these people. But, you know, there are times, I know that even before approaching them, that this may not be a God idea, because if, I, if I'm afraid to present this idea to them, if I, if I kind of know what they're going to say, um, sometimes I will, I will avoid it, right? I will avoid it. And I, I know that in the past, there are times where I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk to everyone else except for them. If you're doing that, chances are whatever idea you're pursuing may not be a God idea. However, when there are wise, godly people who you know will give you the most, most godly, Jesus-centered, gospel-centered, Holy Spirit-filled uh, response you, you, when, you, when you take to them and, and you're just going to trust that God could use them to speak into your life, when, when you're bold and taking that to them, chances are you're pursuing God's heart. And so I would continue to pursue that whatever you're pursuing could be 
a God idea. All right, um, number four, um, you are most likely to be pursuing a God idea if your ultimate purpose is to honor and glorify God. Right? All right, so with your idea, is your ultimate purpose to honor and glorify God, or is it for you to have a good life now? Right? If it's about having a good life now, chances are it's your idea and may not be God's idea. All right? Number five, we are most likely to pursue a God idea when or if we or you, I, recognize our brokenness before God and our need for Him. In our brokenness, we recognize our sin. In our brokenness, we recognize how, how far short we fall of God's glory. In our brokenness, we realize how offensive our sin is to God. You see, it's in our brokenness that, that God shows us what we need and that, that our human efforts fall short of, of getting to where He wants us to be. Our human efforts will cause us to fall short of having a relationship with Him. And, and, and when we see all of this, we recognize that we can't do it on our own and that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. We see God's love for us, and we see His love for us through His Son, Jesus, and we recognize that through Jesus, we can have a relationship with God. Number six, we are most likely to pursue a God idea when or if Jesus is at the center of it all. When or if Jesus is at the center of it all. Not us, not what we want, not our circumstance, not our problems, but Jesus. When Jesus is at the center of it all, our prayers, our pursuit, our vision, our future, we know, we know that this may most likely be a God idea. Now, when we look at rebuilding, when we look at rebuilding, rebuilding is definitely a work of God. Rebuilding our lives to what God desires for it to be is something that is impossible for you and me to do on our own. You see, when we look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, we see Nehemiah, just through his example, right? He, he pointed out to the people. He said, hey, look, Jerusalem is in ruins. And when we recognize our brokenness, when we recognize that we need to rebuild, there, there's a way that, that, that we respond to God. And so we're going we're gonna to see how the people responded uh, to Nehemiah. We're going to see how, what Nehemiah said, and we're going to finish up by making this application to our lives, because all of this relates to the gospel. Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, verse 18, Nehemiah says this, I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me. What, what ne Nehemiah was giving testimony to, what, what he was telling the people is this, that me being here, that Nehemiah being in Jerusalem was not his idea. That Nehemiah leading the rebuilding of the wall was, was not his idea, but that this was God's idea, and that when they respond, if the people respond, they're not, they're not responding to Nehemiah, they're responding to God. And that because this is the work of God, God would be the one to rebuild the walls. God, through them, would lead the people to rebuild the walls, right? So Nehemiah says, I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me, and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. So Nehemiah, he shared, right? He shared with the people. He said, hey, look, Jerusalem lies in ruins. And he presented them with this idea. He showed them that the, the brokenness of the city. And for all this time, for whatever reason, over 100 years, the people did not respond. They did not rebuild. But now the truth of God was placed before them and they responded. They said, let's start rebuilding. You know who caused them to see? God caused, caused them to see. God, through Nehemiah, caused them to see their brokenness, to see their depravity. And so here's another thing about rebuilding. God causes us to see. Right now, there, there may be some of you, you're recognizing that rebuilding needs to happen. And, and if you're seeing that, God is causing you to see. There are others. You may have family or friends. You, you know definitely, whether it's practically, right, their, their, their lives around them. You're saying they need to be rebuilt, and they may not see it. Or maybe there's sin. Many times we don't see the sin in our lives. Well, God causes us to see the sin in our lives. God causes us to see because God's the one who does the work. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this work, right? So the people 
who were apathetic, now they were able to see. They had a vision now. The vision didn't come from Nehemiah. The vision came from God through Nehemiah. And now they were ready to rebuild. Let's move down to verse 20. Verse 20 says this. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. You know what Nehemiah is saying here when he's speaking? Uh, he's talking to, to, the, to Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem. These would be the people who will resist him. What Nehemiah is doing is this. He's saying, this is not my idea. He's confronting the challenges in front of him, and he's saying, this is not my work. This is not my work. God will provide the way. God is the one who's going to make it happen. And that's the same kind of faith that we need as we think about rebuilding. And so some of you may, may wonder, well, how does all of this relate to the gospel? Well, first of all, God through his son Jesus is the one who does the work in you and me. God is the one. When, when Jesus saved us, right, we, we came from sin and death. We came from being separated from God to, to being a child of God. We came from being an enemy of God to being a part of the family of God. That was a work of God. Only God could give what was necessary. Salvation through his son, Jesus. Only God could bring a dead person to life. Only God could be the one to help us recognize our sin and our brokenness. And so rebuilding really starts in our own heart. Re rebuilding, if we want God's idea, it really starts with the work of God in us, either in salvation or as you live, as you go on day to day, seeking the very Jesus who saved you to have his idea and his direction. God also causes us to see. So during this time of rebuilding, right, we, we know that that the things that we see um, in, in doing it God's way, uh, we, we can't see outside of Jesus. We can't see outside of what God wants us to see, but we see through his son Jesus. And today I'm going to ask you, will you, will you see what's going on around you through Jesus? For some, seeing means that, seeing through Jesus means that you recognize your sin and you recognize that you need a savior. Will you go to Jesus for salvation today. For others, you are a follower of Jesus and you've walked away from God. I'm going to ask you right now, as a follower of Jesus, will you go to Jesus and will you ask him, Jesus, show me, show me your idea, give me God's idea, and will you be willing to surrender to God's idea? And then will you trust, right? Will you trust that God will provide the way? That through Christ, God provides the only way to eternal life, that it's through Christ, that this eternal life guarantees our relationship with God, that it is through Christ as we're living right now, right? The gospel speaks into every area of our lives, that God will provide the way. If you're thinking about rebuilding and, and, and doing it because, because of God's idea, it, it's through Christ that, that God will provide the way. God will provide the idea. And it is, it is our pursuit of Jesus that not only gives us the idea, but it's this pursuit of Jesus where we find life. It's the pursuit of Jesus that gives us the strength and everything that we need to rebuild, all right? Hey, let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to, to gather today and to surrender to you, to lay our hearts before you. And God, I pray that you would help us recognize that that our ideas may be good. We may even have the best ideas. But if it's not your idea, it will not last. That our ideas will fail. Our ideas will not give life. But God, your ideas give life, give hope, and really becomes a reflection of your glory. And I pray today that we will choose your idea. That we, we will choose your idea. But God, even more than your idea that we will try, trust Jesus first. And as we pursue Jesus, that we will surrender to the idea that you give us as we walk with Jesus. Father, I pray that you help us to be strong. I pray that we will rebuild in you. Uh, we lift up all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, today we're going to ask you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, we're going to ask that, that, you may, that, that you take some time right now to examine your heart, to examine where you are with Jesus, and to, to, to know that 
Our sin, your sin, right? My sin is an offense to God and that the only way to God is, is through Jesus. And so we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for us, that he became sin for us, that he suffered the wrath of God for us to pay for our sins. And when we believe that, when we repent of our sins, when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, and when we, when, when we surrender our entire lives to Jesus, it is that response, right, based on what Jesus is doing in our lives, it, it is, is because of what Jesus is doing in our lives, and it's that response that reflects salvation in your life and in my life. And so if that is you, or if you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, I want to ask you to get on our church website, thegatheringhawaii.org. And I want to ask you to send us an email. Just click onto the prayer button and just email us. Say, hey, um, what does it mean to follow Jesus or receive Jesus or Jesus save me? Somebody will get with you uh, to talk to you more about what it means to follow Jesus. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus through communion. And so at this time, we want to ask you to examine your heart, examine your life. And after examining your life, we're going to ask you to, to take bread, right? And the bread is a symbol of the body of Christ that suffered for you and me, suffered the wrath of God for you and me. The juice, the grape juice that you drink is a symbol of the blood of Jesus that covers all sin. And so as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, we're going to ask you to partake in communion and to remember what Jesus did for you and me, all right? We do this as often as we can to give thanks and to remember Jesus and also to look forward to his return, all right? So in whatever way you need to respond, uh, let us worship Jesus together as Tim leads us. We've just listened to the message that God had in store for us this week. Um, let it sink into our hearts, let it sink into our minds as we sing and continue to praise our God. So let's sing.
we get a glimpse of that unity here on earth with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, and gives us the goal and the motivation and the example for loving each other more and more. So, Lord, as you are patient with us, let us extend our patience to others. Let us not be worried about the future, what tomorrow brings, about wars and rumors of wars. Because, Lord, you know the number of hairs on our head, the amount of feathers on a sparrow, and you care for the individual flower in a field, Lord. So, how much more is our life in your hands? Lord, that's so reassuring, that's so awe-inspiring, and makes me think, it makes us wonder, Lord, why? why? <laughs> if we don't deserve this kind of love, we don't deserve, deserve this kind of attention, or this kind of grace that you give, but you give it anyway. And Lord, let that be enough for us. Let us not try to pursue anything else. But stay close to your side. So Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the times where we've lost hope or lost sight. Where we've despaired, Lord, and sought other things. Forgive us. And thank you for bringing us back in as prodigal children, Lord. So it's in your son's precious name that we are able to enter your fold and be a part of your family, Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.